welcome to week three of our series on the edge of eternity. So far, we've been examining what scriptures teach regarding the rapture of the church and the rise of the Antichrist. And today, we're going to examine what scripture teaches is happening after the rapture, after the catching away of the church. Today, we're going to look at what's happening in heaven. Next week, we're going to look at what's happening in earth. I mean, on earth, sorry, not in earth, but on earth. Maybe you're thinking, why can't you do both in one day? We don't have all day to be here to cover both of these. And so I had to split it up. I want to remind you, I've told you this already in the past, and I want to remind you again. Scripture never teaches us as believers to look for the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, any other prophetic sign. Scripture teaches us to look for Jesus. Well, then why are we going over this stuff? I want you to know what Scripture teaches so you're not led astray by false teaching, but I don't want you to look for these signs. I want you to look for Jesus. Okay? So we're looking for Jesus. Our focus in this series is not to get everyone to agree exactly what happens when. Our focus is to cause us as the church to, to rejoice because Jesus is coming. In the Greek, the word for rejoice, Jesus is coming, is Maranatha. Maranatha. Rejoice, Jesus is coming. Jesus said in Revelation 22, 7, look, I am coming soon. So let's talk about what's happening after the saints are raptured out, after the church is called away. Let's talk about what's happening in heaven. Now, I was reading this week, and I've been reading so much and refreshing my memory, and, and I read something that said, um, some people believe and they think for us to teach the catching away of the church, the rapture of the church, some people say that's escapism, like, like we're wanting God to help us escape from the coming wrath of God, from the coming judgments of God. But that's not the case. Because what you have to understand is when the church is raptured away, we all are going to be judged by Jesus himself. You see, as soon as the rapture takes place, the saints who have been caught away will stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, and they will give an account for how they live their lives on this earth. So what does that mean for you and for me? When we're caught away, we're going to give an account for how we live. Now, eternal life is a free gift on the basis of God's love and grace, but we each must still be judged by Jesus. When we accept Christ into our life, when we become a Christian, a judgment is made. When we accept Jesus, God looks at our life and says they're covered by the blood of Jesus. They are saved because of their faith in Jesus. We are covered by the shed blood of Jesus. Once we begin living for Jesus, the goal of our lives is to finish well. What's the goal of your life? It should be to finish well. Your goal shouldn't be to please people, to make everybody happy. Your goal should be to finish well. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. Did you finish well? I love what Paul writes in Philippians 3, 14. He says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. See, the goal in our life is not salvation. The goal is finishing well. And the key to finishing well is salvation, which is found in Jesus. And once we find salvation in Jesus, once we receive salvation in Jesus, we then start a journey into living and becoming like him and trying to finish well. Every day, we should be growing in godliness. Every day, we should be growing to become more and more like Jesus. How you doing? Let me be honest with you. There are some days I fall way, 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 way short of Jesus. And on my best day, I still fall miserably short of Jesus. So I don't know about you, but I am still a work in progress. I do know about you. You are too. We're all a work in progress becoming like Jesus. And our goal is to finish well. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So the judgment seat of Christ is where the saints go after the rapture of the church and each one stands before Christ Jesus and gives an account of their lives here on earth. Paul tells us in Romans 14.12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. You see what that said? Paul said we give a personal account. In other words, you're not responsible for me, I am. And I'm responsible for you because I'm your pastor. But when you stand before the Lord, you're responsible for yourself. You can't say, well, Pastor Joe never told me. The Lord's going to go, nope, you have my word. You have the Holy Spirit. You with me? In both 2 Corinthians 5 and in Romans 14, Paul is teaching about the judgment seat of Christ. This phrase, judgment seat of Christ, comes from the Greek word bema. And Strong's Concordance defines Bama as a raised step, a platform to which someone walks up to receive a judgment, or literally a tribunal, a court of justice. So the judgment seat of Christ is very literally the divine tribunal of Jesus Christ. And at the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is the judge. 
Jesus says in John 5, 22. He says, in addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. Romans 2, 16, Paul says, and this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. Now think about what Paul just said. There's a day coming when the Lord will judge everyone's secret life. So this morning you're like, well, I'm in church, everything's well. On the surface it appears well, but the Lord knows the secret things in your heart. And if you don't confess and deal with those things now, you will give an account for those things later. And let me just help you. It's always better to deal with things now than when you have to give an account later. Everything, every person who's ever professed faith in Christ Jesus will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And every person will give an account for their short time on earth. Everything will be judged. Everything. Our words, our actions, our motives, our attitudes, our character, our use of spiritual gifts, our non-use of spiritual gifts, our use of material goods. Everything matters and will be judged. Think about this. Everything you have in your life is a gift from the Lord. And everything you have that the Lord gifted you, he didn't gift it to you for you. He gifted it to you for you to use for his kingdom. And so if you have the gift of teaching, it's not so people can go, oh, you're such a great teacher. It's so you can teach those who need teaching. If you have the gift of hospitality, it's not so people can go, you have such a beautiful home. You're so hospitable. We just love coming to your house. It's so you can reflect Jesus. If you have the gift of giving, it's so that, not so people can go, you're just such a giver, but it's so you can give and glorify God. And we can go on and on and on. Everything we have is from the Lord. But listen, all the things we have, one day we're going to give an account for those. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment. We all have an appointment with the Lord. We are all going to face either death or death or the rapture of the church, and we're all going to stand before the Lord and give an account for our lives on earth. Christ the King will judge all who profess allegiance to him. Now, he's not judging sinfulness. He made atonement for our sins at the cross. He's judging what we did after we received him. This is a time for us as believers to give an account of the substance of our lives as Christians. In other words, we'll be judged by how we lived as a believer. First Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes, and he helps us understand this judgment seat of Christ. Verse 10, he says, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds in that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Paul tells us here that our works are compared to materials. And some are working and building their life with good materials like gold, silver, and precious jewels. And gold, silver, and precious jewels, when they're placed in fire, they become more pure. But others, the materials in their life represent wood, hay, and straw. And it's not rocket science. What happens to wood, hay, and straw when you put it in fire? It burns up. It's gone. So what kind of, what kind of materials are you building your life with, your life in Christ? Are you using things that are going to be purified in fire or things that are going to be burned away in fire? If our works in life are equivalent to gold, silver, and precious jewels, when tried by fire, they they result in a reward. But if our works in life are equivalent to wood, hay, and straw, when tried by fire, they will burn up and we will receive no reward. Now, let me make this real clear and understand. When you're caught away in the rapture, that tells us you belong to Jesus. Your salvation is not in question. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is not looking at you wondering if you should be saved and get into heaven. You're, You're coming in because of his blood covers your life. What he's looking at into your life on earth is what kind of value did you bring to the kingdom? And scripture teaches that through his eyes of fire, he will will judge us. 
And when he judges us with those eyes of fire, the things that are gold, silver, and precious stones will be purified. The things we did with hay and straw will be burned away. There will be some in eternity who don't receive a crown because it didn't do anything that matters. Okay. I love you. <laughs> Sitting in church doesn't matter. Nobody's going to be in heaven and go, Lord, I should get a reward. I went to church every Sunday. I had perfect attendance for church every Sunday. And the Lord's going to go, I don't care. I don't care. We are not called to sit in church. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus extended to the world around us. Paul said in Romans, he said, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Well, I'm not called to ministry. Yes, you are. If you've given your life to Jesus, you're called to ministry. You're called to help others see the truth of Jesus, to share the good news. And this is one way we do that. I'm bringing you the good news. I bring you the meal. This is my calling. But you can also bring the good news in youth ministry, in kids ministry, in nursery, as a greeter, mowing the lawn, cleaning the church, whatever, all these things we want to do. Oh, pastor, you're just trying to get us to serve. Yes, I want you to serve because I want you to get a reward. I want, I want you to hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Please understand, our salvation is secured by faith in the atoning work of Jesus. But our reward is a result of how we lived out our faith. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. There are still people who have this idea, I'm saved by what I do, but you're not. Paul clearly teaches salvation is only by faith in Jesus and nothing else. But good deeds are important. Now, understand this morning. We don't do good deeds. We don't do what we do because we want to get a reward. We do the things we do because we love Jesus, because he gave his heart for us. He gave his life for us. And if he gave everything for me, I'm going to give everything for him. I've said it before previously. Do you understand? I owe everything to Jesus. I'm where I am today because of Jesus. Without Jesus, I'm lost and hopeless. And so are you. And because he's forgiven me a much, I want to honor him as much as I can. And I don't have a lot of wealth. I don't have a lot of material things, but I have hands and feet that can go and do things for him. I want to honor him, not so I can get a reward, but because I love him. Our love for Jesus must be the driving force of everything we do. We should labor for the Lord simply because we love him. I like how James writes, and he says in, in James 2.20, he says, how foolish, can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Skip down to verse 26. He says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. See, good deeds cannot save us. But they prove we really have faith because people see us doing the good things. Our faith is shown by our good deeds. And our good deeds will be revealed when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Some of the greatest things you can do are things nobody ever sees you do. In fact, if you're serving in a ministry team for recognition, just stop. Because your heart's there, your motives are wrong. We should desire to serve so that nobody notices, but Jesus notices. He notices. And we have to be the kind of people that say, you know what, I'm going to do things in obscurity. I'm going to do things that nobody notices, but my king notices, my my savior notices. And one day I hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, because I'm doing it unto him. I love what Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Look what he says. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. Verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but all who eagerly look forward to, this, his, to his appearing. Paul, did you see what he said? He said, I fought the good fight. In other words, I kept swinging. There's, there's a song, there's a, there's a Christian artist, Toby Mack, and he has a song 
Um, and I forget the name of the song, I'm drawing a blank, but in the song, he's like, um, if I go down, I'm going to go down swinging. And that's what I picture Paul. He's like, I fought, I was swinging the whole way. I fought to the very end. And then he says, I have finished the race. There's a great quote that I love. It's by an anonymous track coach, and it says, the race doesn't always go to the swift, but to the one who keeps running. I don't like running, but here's what I know about races. You can't finish if you stop running. You can't win if you stop running. So you got to keep running. And Paul says, I finished the race. And then he says, I have remained faithful. You know what it means to remain faithful? You keep doing what you know you're supposed to do even when nobody notices. You keep doing what you're supposed to do even when you don't feel like it. You keep doing what you're supposed to do knowing that your Father in Heaven is watching. I wrote down in my notes, I just think this is a great scripture. 1 Peter 5, look what Peter writes in verse 1. And now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he's revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you will get out of it, but because, of, because you're eager to serve God. Don't lord it over people to sign to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. And here's why I put this verse in here. It's love what Peter says. In verse 2, he says, Care for the flock that God has entrusted you to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it. There are some that want to do things for what they can get out of it. There are some who will do things in the church and they'll grab about it the whole time. That's, that's grudgingly. You're just like, I'm so I'm so I'm going to do this. That's not what God wants us to do. There's no reward for griping. There's no reward for complaining. But there's a reward for being faithful. I love how Peter teaches here. He says, speaking to me as a pastor, care for the flock God has entrusted in you. Watch over it willingly. He says, um, lead by your own good example. When I tell you we get to serve, it's not just something we made up. That's, I believe we, it's an honor we get to serve. And I have staff, they come to me and they're like, stop doing everything. I'm like, but I love it. I want to show up and do everything. But I can't do everything. There have been, I used to come help clean. And I promise you, I would come on Thursday night and I would grab a broom or I'd grab a vacuum. I'd grab something and start cleaning. And I, I'd do it for five minutes and somebody would take it away from me. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to quit going to clean because they're not going to let me clean anyway. And my friend made a statement. I heard him. He was talking on the same matter. He says, hey, he goes, stop taking away my broom. He's like, let me serve you. You want to help? Get a broom and help me, but don't take away my broom. And I was like, yeah, yeah, because here's what you have to understand. If I'm not careful, if I just let you do all the serving and let you take care of everything, all of a sudden the enemy starts speaking to my mind and says, well, you're the king and you have a first class ticket and you should just sit back and enjoy the privilege. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Jesus came to serve and I'm following Jesus and he was the greatest servant and I want to be like him, so I'm going to serve too. I wrote down another scripture that you're going to think this makes no sense, but it does. Hebrews 13, 17, the writer of Hebrews says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Let me read that again. I want you to see the power of what Hebrews says. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. My responsibility is to watch over your soul. And I'm accountable to God for how I watch over your soul. And when I see people not serving the Lord wholeheartedly, my responsibility is to nudge you along in the right direction. And here's what happens every time. Who does he think he is? What's he calling me out for? Don't he know I've given my time to do this? I do, I do. But what you need to understand is I have to do what I'm called to do so I can hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. And you have to do what you're called to do so you can hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want you to get the greatest reward. I don't want you to miss out. So why are the saints judged at the judgment seat of Christ? Why does it matter if we do anything? Why can't it just be we accepted Jesus and things are good enough? 
It's a great question. Here's the answer. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul writes in verse 1. And he says, Look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Verse 2. Now, a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this, po- this point. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. Listen, here's what the scripture is saying. As Christians, we are stewards. We are managers of things that don't belong to us. Everything we have is the Lord's. This is not my church. It's not even your church. It's his church. We're just stewards. We're just managers. And if we'll manage it well, God will continue to bless it. If we manage it poorly, God will remove some blessings and go, look, you're not taking care of what I've given you, so how can I give you more? I want God to be proud for how we manage what was his. We are simply just managing what belongs to the Lord. And when we stand before Jesus on this judgment day, we'll give an account for the things he gave us to manage throughout our lives. Will we be found faithful? Will you be found faithful when you stand before the Lord? The judgment seat of Christ reveals what each believer has accomplished in this life that God noticed and God considered worthwhile. All Christians are going to receive a reward if they've worked in the right way. Especially, listen, especially those who have labored in obscurity and those who have labored with great sacrifice and faithfulness. Why do you do what you do for the kingdom of God? Is it so people will notice? Is it so you'll be famous? I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be anybody. I want to be the guy that got old, pastoring a church in Crumb, Texas, and people are like, where's that at? And you say Denton, and they go, where's that at? And you go, it's by Dallas. That's what I do all the time. I just, people don't know. I want to be the guy that was faithful, and when I stand before the Lord, he noticed everything. I don't care if people notice. I don't want to be great in your eyes. I want to be great in his eyes. And then he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. I read this statement this this week and I tried to reword it so I wouldn't plagiarize, but I probably didn't reword it enough. But I don't even know who said it. I just found it. It was good. Listen to this. Where you spend eternity is determined by what you do with Jesus. Where you spend eternity is determined by what you do with Jesus. How you spend eternity is determined what you do after accepting Jesus. Today we're not talking about where, we're talking about how. How are you going to spend eternity? being honored, finishing well. And so after the rapture of the church, all the saints of all time are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then after the judgment seat of Christ, all the church, all the saints are going to be ushered into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 6, John the Revelator says, Then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has, been, has prepared herself. She's been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words that come from God. So those who have stood before the judgment seat of Christ, they're the ones that are the redeemed. They're invited to the wedding feast. And the angel said, blessed are those who are invited. If you belong to Jesus, you're invited. Are you going? We're going to go and we're going to celebrate this great feast. Matthew 22, verse number one, Jesus told them other parables and he said in verse two, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a king who prepared a great feast for his son. The marriage supper of the lamb is compared to a great wedding feast and everyone in heaven will attend this wedding feast and it will, it will be an actual meal. It'll be an actual meal. Jesus even referred to this great feast at the last supper with his disciples. Luke twenty two sixteen, 16, he said, I tell you, I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. We aren't given a lot of detail about the marriage supper of the Lamb, but we know it's going to be a great feast. It's going to be a celebration. And the only way to go is surrendering your life to Jesus. The only way to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb is to die in Jesus or be raptured with Jesus. And as I'm checking the room, nobody's died in Jesus yet. So we're going to be raptured together. We're going to to go to the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to give an account. We're going to receive a reward, a crown, a reward of some kind, and we're going to go celebrate. 
All of this is happening in heaven, while on earth the wrath of God is being poured out. Earlier I told you, some say, well, the rapture is preaching escapism. It's not. Those who are raptured are going to stand before Jesus, and they're going to be judged. Those on earth who have rejected Jesus, God's going to pour out his wrath. Not because he's mad, not because he's angry, because sometimes it takes the wrath of God to make people open their eyes. And as you'll see as we go on and continue our journey, on earth as the wrath of God is being poured out, horrible things are going to happen on earth, and yet men and women are still going to have hard hearts, and they're still going to reject God. They're still not going to repent. It's kind of like this morning. We worshiped, and the presence of the Lord met us here, and we experienced the manifestation of his presence, and he said, he said, I'm here, and I'm waiting on you. And there are some that you're the one the Lord's waiting on, and you're going to walk out of here if nothing happened. How can you do that? God's presence was here. How can you walk away from his presence, ignoring his presence? Because the veil's over your heart, because your heart is hard, and you're missing what God has for you. If you can't respond here, how are you going to rejoice later? We know all this takes place during the seven year tribulation. And some say the marriage supper of the Lamb happens on the last day. I couldn't find scripture to verify the timing. Can I tell you, timing doesn't matter. Look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. Just know, I'm looking for Jesus, and when he comes, he's going to call us home, and we're going to stand before him, we're going to give an account, and after we've given an account and we've been rewarded for what we did in this life, we're going to have a celebration, a meal together with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and it's going to be a great banquet, a great feast, and there's going to be so much joy there. And you know what I figured out? Because I was thinking about it like this. For seven years, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and have a wedding feast. That's like a long time for two events, right? But you know what? When you're having fun, time flies by. And I was thinking this week about this because I thought, Lord, how am I going to explain this? Because some people are going to be scratching their heads going, he doesn't make any sense. He didn't give us any details. I don't know the details. But I know this. The joy of being in the Lord's presence is going to be the greatest joy we've ever experienced. The joy of hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant, is greater than any reward he could give us. So I don't need a reward. I just want to hear that. Oh, I want, I want to hear that, and I want the reward too. Because I'm convinced. I, I can't prove it because I haven't been there yet, but I'm convinced. If we're given a crown or we're given some kind of reward, it's not going to be about us, but it's going to be to glorify him. It's going to be to magnify him. And I want to have the, all the tools necessary that I can give Jesus as much glory and much praise as possible. And then sit down and feast with him. After the marriage supper of the Lamb, the saints, dressed in heavenly garments, are going to return to earth, led by Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're going to come back behind him. He's going to lead. We're going to come back. It's his army. Now think about this army. It's all the saints of all eternity, all the hosts of heaven. Everyone who's gone before us are going to be with him. And he's coming back. And this time, when he comes back, and I'll show you this later in Scripture, he will set foot on the Mount of Olives. And when he does, there will be a great earthquake, and the Mount of Olives will split in two. And all the armies of the world will be gathered around him, and he will defeat all the armies of the world with his word. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's so fun. I'm convinced. Here's what happens. Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives, and he's just going to go, I am. And people are going to fall down because he is the great I am. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there's no one like him, and he is conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me show you what Scripture says. It's just a preview of what's coming later. Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven open. And a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. Guess who that is? It's Jesus. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe and at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings 
and Lord of all lords. That's why we're doing what we do, because we serve the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, and we're living our life for His glory and His honor. Life is not about this planet. Life's about eternity. And when I get to eternity, I want to have the Lord look at me and say, Son, you did a good job. You ran a good race. You kept the faith. You fought a good fight. Now come into the reward I prepared for you. Well, you can't get there without Jesus. you got to have Jesus. As we conclude, let me ask you this question I asked you earlier. When you stand before Jesus, Will you be found faithful? Will you? Listen, you, you can't stand before him and go, well, nobody ever told me, Lord. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's written in the word. I didn't write it. Jesus did. He's the word. It's written there. Every student, look at me and listen to me. When you stand before Jesus, you can't say, well, my mom and dad didn't show me the way. You're in church this morning. Mom and dad brought you to church. You're hearing the truth. You're responsible for you. Mom and dad, keep showing your kids Jesus. Keep living your life pursuing Jesus so your kids can follow your example. They're not going to figure it out on their own, but you've got to be mom and dad, and you've got to show them how to live for Jesus. We need each other, but we give an account for ourselves. I wasn't planning to be this emotional. I don't know what happened. This is, I'm excited. And I was thinking about this. The Christian life is really not about getting a reward. It's about being Jesus with skin on. But knowing what's ahead should be our motivation to be more like Jesus. And there's a scripture that I read this week as I was preparing and it didn't seem to fit, but then this morning it fits and it's not on the screen. Because I'll begin to think to myself, what does all this mean for me right now? What do I do with everything we just shared? In Micah 6, 9, 6 8, scripture says, Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what it requires of you. Do what is right, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. We are called to be Jesus with skin under the world around us, to do what is right, to love mercy. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. And sometimes Christians are the meanest people, the most merciless people. Stop being merciless and be full of mercy, be full of grace, and walk humbly before your God. Listen, to walk humbly, you can't be full of yourself. You can't be full of arrogance and pride. To walk humbly, says, Lord, I'm, I'm nobody without you. I owe it all to Jesus. And I want people to see him more than they see me. Will you walk humbly before the Lord your God? Let's pray today. God, I thank you today. God, thank you. It's so much fun to come together and worship you. It's so much fun reading your word and letting your word read us and take root in our hearts. And I thank you for the time we've had together just to rejoice because our King is coming, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Holy Spirit, I know you're working our hearts today. God, we sense your presence here already. You told us you're here and you're waiting. And so I pray first of all for the one or the two or how many there are. Maybe there are some that earlier in the service, they were supposed to respond because you called out to them and they, for whatever reason, didn't. Would you give them one more opportunity to respond and to come to you? Maybe there are some here today that the talk of future events, the talk of eternity and standing before Jesus, the talk of the church being raptured away and the wrath of God being poured out on earth, it causes them fear and concern and it's because they know that their lives are not right with Jesus. They know that should Jesus come right now, they would be left behind. Holy Spirit, would you tug at the hearts of sons and daughters and bring them to a place of repentance today? And maybe there are some that they love Jesus with all their heart this morning. But the Holy Spirit's convicting them and showing them because they haven't, been, they haven't been building their life with the right materials. They've been using wood, hay, and straw, things that are going to be destroyed and not going to matter. And you've wanted them to build with gold and silver and precious jewels. They've had wrong motives and wrong attitudes, but today the Holy Spirit's stirring them to change their attitude and give their best, fight the good fight, finish their race because Jesus gave everything for them. Lord, touch them today. Holy Spirit, have your way in our hearts today. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're coming soon. You're our hope. You're our hope. You're what gets us out of bed and keeps us going every day because we know today could be the day. And if it's not, we'll look for you tomorrow. We're going to keep 
be in Jesus' skin on, expecting you to come in any moment. So Lord, help us to represent you well. Help us to finish well. Bless each one today in Jesus' name. Just for a moment, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. No one's looking around. And I just wonder, real quick, are you here today? And you'll say, Pastor, today, uh, nobody's looking around. This is between you and Jesus. And you would say, Pastor, today, the Lord's been tugging on my heart. I should have responded earlier because he's here, and I know he's here, and I need, he's waiting on me, and I need to respond. I need to be obedient, and I need to respond today. If that's you, every head is bowed. No one's looking around. Slip up your hand. I want to pray for you this morning. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are you here this morning and you say, Pastor, today the Holy Spirit has shown me through our time in the Word that there's some stuff in my life I need to make right with Jesus. I need to surrender some things. If that's you, slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Last question. And we're going to pray and we're going to be done. Say, Pastor, today through our time in the Word, the Lord has shown me well, yes, I love Jesus, and I want, I'm committed, and I'm faithful. I haven't been doing everything that I could to honor him. I haven't been living in a way, I haven't been serving in a way that brings honor to him. And the Holy Spirit has shown me today I need to change my motives, change my attitude, change my heart, and the way I'm serving. If that's you, slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Would you stand with me this morning? God, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you for how you led today. Thank you for how you're touching hearts and lives today. Lord, I thank you for this one that responded and said, the Lord's been waiting on me. And right where they stand, would you wrap your arms around them? Would you just surround them and overwhelm them with your love, with your peace, with your mercy, your grace? Whatever it is that they've been carrying, Whatever it is that they needed you to call them out today, meet them right there and help them to let go, to lay that thing down. Help them to find hope in you, find deliverance in you, find joy in you, to find strength in you. God, just touch them today. This is your child, and I know you love them so much, and you orchestrated this entire day for them to surrender to you. Father, I pray for those that this morning there's stuff in their life that's not right between them and Jesus. Holy Spirit, stir them to the point that they won't leave until they make things right. That they make an altar at their chair or at their front and they kneel down and they just make things right with you. And Father, I pray over every hand that was raised. You've shown so many today that they're not serving with right motives. They're building with the wrong materials. They, they love you, but they're not fully representing you the way to their full potential. God, teach us to become the men and women of God you've called us to be. Teach us to serve just like Jesus served, to model a life of service like he did. Teach us to be Jesus' hands and feet to the world around us. Not so people will notice, but because you're watching and you'll notice. Not because we want accolades from people, but because we want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And we want to have a reward that we can use to worship and adore you. God, I pray you would just bless each one today. As your children go their separate way, watch over them. Bless them and keep them. Show them your kindness. Have mercy on them. Watch over us throughout this week and give us peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please, share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church, and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.